really enjoyed the film. I literally just finished watching it about 10 minutes ago. So it's very oh, awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, congratulations on it. Um, I mean, it's something that seemingly already has been getting a lot of a lot of good buzz and a lot of good reviews and stuff like that. That must be exciting, given I can imagine it wasn't, you know, it was an independent film and, you know, you always want to get as much ox oxygen to it as you, as you possibly can. Yeah, yeah. John and, uh, and Mikey deserve it, you know. I, uh, I really like the way the film turned out. Uh, I had a lot of fun making the film. And so uh, I, you know, I hope that they, I hope they get a lot of uh, energy off of it. Yeah. How did uh, Jonathan kind of approach you about it? Was, was it the script that came to you first or was it him himself that, uh, you know, gave you a call and said, I've got this project that you might be interested in? <laughs> so um, John worked on a film that our friend and producer uh, had formally written and directed. Uh, his name is Kenny Riches. Uh, Kenny is a friend of mine that I grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah with. And uh, John was doing sound on the last film that we made. And so we got to know each other on that set uh, pretty casually. And then Kenny sent me this script for My Heart Can't Beat Unless You Tell It To, and just said, hey, remember John, he's making this movie. Uh, I'm producing it and uh, you're playing Dwight. And I was like, oh, okay. And uh, I started reading it. He gave me no other preface besides that he was basically like john wrote it i helped him with some revisions you're playing dwight that's it so i was like okay dwight so it opens up with with dwight as you know and then dwight kills a man and then <laughs> proceeds to harvest his blood and i was like i had no idea any of that was coming i would know i like you know i was like what the fuck <laughs> this is awesome <laughs> this is so crazy uh, and then, you know, I met the uh, the Thomas character while I was reading it. And I was like, ah, OK, this is a really cool alternate sort of perspective on this type of story. And um, and so, uh, you know, from there, I, I got more and more excited, um, started talking to John and, and Kenny and was just basically as soon as I read it, I was like, yeah, this is this is awesome. I'm uh, ready to go. Yeah. And it's one of those films that feels very fresh. You know, as you say, it's about something that the, the less people know going into it, the better, because I feel like it's one of those movies that people could put in a box and say, oh, it's about this, when actually it's about a lot, lot more. Was that something for you when you were reading it and didn't know too much about it, that you were discovering all of these things the same way that an audience are going to? Because oh, yeah. it's very, very, you know, if you take it out of the box of what people might think it is, it's it's really, really uh, original and interesting. Yeah, it's kind of hard to avoid it being sort of framed for you, you know, as like you say, put in a box, like, you know, somebody who's trying to get their buddy to watch a vampire movie would be like, it's a vampire movie, but like, trust me, it's not like the other vampire movies you've seen or somebody who's not into vampire movies, you would describe it as a character driven family dynamic drama. Um, but it's, it's really, uh, really well done in the way that it rides the line between all of those things. And so it's hard to do, but I would recommend if people can manage it to not even watch the trailer, just go straight into it, um, you know, just expecting to see some fun storytelling and then uh, <laughs> be, be appalled and surprised as you as you make your way through it. Yeah, I think the title itself is a is a lure. If you just put that title up, it's it's got you know so many words and has so many meanings in itself that people would just like. For me, anyway, would just be like, I've got to see this film just for the title. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, so I mean, you've done a lot of different characters in your career. Dwight again seems like something that you genuinely were excited for and something that was very different and allowed you to do some different things that you'd not done before. Um, is that stuff that you look for always when you're, when you, you know, you're reading scripts and stuff that if things are a little bit different to what you've done before, those are the ones that you kind of gravitate to? Yeah. I mean, um, you know, um, obviously playing similar roles is, is like not necessarily a bad thing, but, uh, I think for most actors, you know, it's very appealing to uh, try new areas of your own psyche out and try to resonate with different uh, types of characters, different ar archetypal 
personalities, you know, and Dwight is for sure, <laughs> for sure one of those. Um, you know, I, I think it's fun to play different characters a lot. And I think it's fun to particularly play characters that are not similar to me, you know, uh, sort of the more dissimilar, if dissimilar is a word, uh, the more dissimilar to me, the better, I think, just because it's so fun to try to create an authentic and uh, believable personality that is far from my own. You know, I, I find a lot of like creative juice in that, uh, in that venture. So Dwight's, Dwight is for sure, for sure one of those. And so, you know, getting into him and, you know, was exciting because his, his mentality is much different than mine. He's, uh, his physicality is different than mine. So I, you know, had a lot of fun preparing his sort of, his sort of, you know, truculent sort of burdened walking and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. And, and, uh, so yeah, super exciting and also super rewarding. I really had a lot of fun with him. Yeah. And let me ask you about working with, with Ingrid and Owen, because for a lot of the movie, it's like almost like a play in some regard in the sense that it's you three and you're doing these things obviously there's all the other stuff going on but as an actor that must be a fantastic space to be in when you're with two other actors two other actors like this and it's just you kind of in this relationship trying to decide you know your next moves and all the things like that I mean that that must make it even more exciting and and give you so much kind of energy the fact that there's the three of you kind of not sparring off each other but having the relationships that you have in the film yeah absolutely um you know we had to make it very familial and also very tense. And there's a lot of power dynamic struggle going on within the, the, the trifecta. And there's also the, uh, you know, the aspect of the supernatural uh, thing that's going, that's sort of hovering over the whole thing, you know, and um, uh, you know, it, it's great because in this case it, it's vampirism, but it really could be anything. It could be some type of addiction or something else that the family is being sort of driven apart by. Um, it's kind of a universal uh, thing. So I think for myself at least, and I, I believe for Ingrid and, and Owen, uh, there was a very familiar, you know, universal set of family dynamics that were going on. So, the material provided us with a very easy sort of current to sort of get into and flow. And uh, Ingrid and Owen are both fantastic actors. And so, you know, a lot of times I was just trying to fit in and keep up with them. And, and, uh, and, you know, I, I think it was really great. You know, it really didn't take much time for us to, to fall into our roles, you know, the sibling roles, uh, uh, in any of the combinations of, you know, interpersonal relationships and particularly with Ingrid, because, um, you know, Jesse and Dwight have such a intense cerebral connection, intense relationship. And Jesse is so tyrannical and so powerful and Dwight is so sort of weak, weak and, and um, but still, you know, protesting to what they're doing but he can't quite work himself up to actually, you know, stop anything that he believes is wrong. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, for me, it's like the material was there and the actors brought the energy. It was pretty easy. You know? And this is, I believe this is Jonathan's first film, which I couldn't believe because it's so polished and so confident and like all the things you would expect from someone who's made four, five, six films. And it really strikes you, how kind of talented he is even though it's his first film I mean when you, you've done movies before lots of different directors what kind of set him apart and what makes him so I guess unique the fact that he's able to do this for his first film which is just extraordinary I would say the biggest thing that stands apart is a passion for the craft of storytelling and filmmaking so there's a lot of people who want to tell their own stories the kind of way that they want and uh, many of them are interested in creating some unique way of telling it, their story rather than observing structures that have been successful throughout storytelling history, even before film existed, but especially 
you know, in film because we can rewatch a lot of those and like really quantify what it is that those stories are telling us and how those stories are telling us what they're telling us. And uh, John and his brother, Mike, really pay a lot of attention to that, um, you know, kind of like I guess the expression would be film buffs or film geeks. But they really, um, aside from loving storytelling and, and being told stories and watching films, they love um, dissecting the way that the films are made and why they're made that way and what effect that has on the audience. And if you, if you can tap into those formulas and those universal you know, success structures, uh, cinematic language, you know, um, dramatic tethers and, and emotional tethers and resonance and that sort of thing. Um, you know, you don't, you don't need a lot of um, previous experience to sort of apply those things that you're passionate about to something that you really care a lot about. Like they care, they cared a lot about this film and it shows in the way that they prepared for it. It shows in the way that they have loved films that influenced them. And, uh, and I think it shows in the final edit of this film you know it's a they were prepared you know but uh also they knew how to prepare because they'd done so much studying of the craft and um they care so much to be good at it that uh that they are you know it's like if you if you spend the hours and it's a lot of hours because you got to basically watch a lot of fucking movies but if you if you take that time and if you care about it and if you pay attention and if you remember what it is that resonates and why um, you're able to recreate those formulas and they have done a very, very good job of it, I think. And, uh, and that's why it does feel like an experienced filmmaker um, has made this film, you know, and in a way, in a way he is, he just hasn't, you know, it's just his first time he's gotten the whole crew together to actually make one, but he is, you know, uh, an experienced filmmaker. Yeah. I was hoping that you were uh, clean shaven because your beard game in this film is is very 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 strong. It's a <laughs> really nice kind of bushy, bushy beard, which you don't people don't get to do a lot in movies. But it, it seems yeah. if you have good beards. It's something worth mentioning. I think I can't grow a very good beard, so I'm always a bit <laughs> envious. <laughs> I you know I never I think I could only grow a beard like that in the last eight years like after i turned 30 it was all of a sudden it was like hey i can grow a beard <laughs> <laughs> but before that it would it was just kind of patchy and like i didn't have anything on my cheeks it was just all on my neck and i didn't have a mustache like you know it was very awkward if i tried it before then um but yeah i had grown the beard out initially for uh for another thing um and then i kind of came to kenny and john and i was like hey you know what are we going to do with this beard and and they really liked it and i and i think it ends up suiting the character in the end you know it's a it's sort of bedraggled and it's it's you know um not particularly stylized and it's it goes through periods of being more groomed and then also being more bushy and disheveled just like dwight you know it's a it's an interesting thing yeah, it's a good storytelling device, isn't it? If a character's become yeah. more disheveled, the beard starts to... <laughs> um, I did want to take this opportunity to, to speak to you about... Uh, you are in one of my favourite films of the last 10 years, uh, which is Queen of Earth, which is a film that I don't think many many people have really seen, but they really should. Um, I, just, I was just always curious about that film because when I saw it for the first time, I saw it on a, on a laptop and it kind of struck me so hard I had to go and see it again and I've got the blu-rays and stuff now and now you know obviously yourself Catherine Waterstone and Elizabeth Moss have become these big stars and it seems to be a film that still many people haven't seen but I just wondered what your experience was like on that film because I, I absolutely love that film it's it's there's so much going on in it that you could spend an hour talking about it <laughs> yeah thanks I I really like that one too uh Alex Ross Perry uh, got me involved with that he wrote it and he directed it obviously but uh, he reached out to my um, representation and and I read the script and uh, you know obviously based on Elizabeth's prior work and, and Alex's prior work um, I wasn't familiar with Catherine at, at that time but obviously became very familiar with her um, you know during the filming and then after that um, but uh, I, I 
enjoyed it. And I, I was like, okay, I'm going to jump in because this is creatively very exciting, but I didn't really grasp what it was going to be like, because the script was just the words that these characters were saying to each other. So I was like, okay, these people are being really nasty to each other. And there's some in interesting psychological stuff going on, but I'm not really sure, you know, I'm not really sure how to fit into this yet. And then as soon as we started filming, uh, Alex was doing all of this amazing cinematography and, and energy capture through his cinematic language with his DP. And, you know, they were sort of kindling that old horror, that old, very cerebral kind of uncomfortable cognitive dissonance horror that uh, came out of the 60s and 70s, Polanski films and stuff like that, which I know influenced him on that. Um, but as soon as I saw him starting to do that stuff, I was like, oh, there's a lot more going on than I thought there was. And um, which actually informed a lot of my performance because it is such a psychological piece, that one. And um, it was so fun playing it with, uh, with Elizabeth. Like a lot of our scenes ended up being fairly improvised and um, where we had guidelines and we had to go from A to B, but, uh, you know, how we got from A to B was kind of experimental. And, and that was really, that was really fun to do, really rewarding to do and watch her go through her fucking crazy journey and like, and, and play a, a very sort of malicious, uh, bullying type of, you know, psychologically toxic presence, that guy. It was interesting. Yeah. Yeah, the tra have you ever seen the trailer for for the film? It is. It has this really ominous voice. I mean, it's just like one of the best trailers I've ever seen. But that, that voice, <laughs> over, honestly, it was just so creepy. But it really sets up what the well, most of what the film is. But you still obviously discover a lot. But that, I mean, it's one of my favorite trailers ever. I think it's so, yeah, so so well done, <laughs> so good. And it's like I can tell it's Alex also having fun. Like, yeah, you know, composing a trailer like that. He's like, this is so fun. This is you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's such a thing for him but then it it's like we're talking about universal formulas and structures like we recognize that you know probably from our childhood in in trailer format and stuff but like to see it again it's like yeah it still works you know it's, it's <laughs> it really so cool. is it really even now if you put it on a big screen in front of a horror film people would that's what they should do that's what they should do oh yeah yeah <laughs> um, absolutely yeah just as a final question um we in the UK are about to get a super duper remaster 4K of Almost Famous, which has not been released, I don't think, for in the UK for like in that form with lots of extras and lots of other things. And it's a movie that people still seem to seem to love. So I just wanted to ask you about it because it's a movie that I love as well. And specifically working with the great Philip Seymour Hoffman, which not a lot of people sadly got to do in his in his in his life, which is still, you know, such a such a shame. I just wondered that. And also your memories of the film, you know, 20 years, 21 years later, that it's still resonating with people, still finding people and young audiences are watching it and still, you know, grasping to, to what Cameron was trying to do. Yeah, I mean, that goes back to more universal storytelling and resonance. Like Cameron, Cameron is always so good at capturing those things that we all feel as like true vibration. Like he's good at, it's sort of like hitting a tuning fork and then like putting that that tone in his film and everybody harmonizes with it. He's so fucking good at it. And I think probably Almost Famous is the best uh, example of him being able to do that. Also because it was so true to him. So, mm. you know, I think a lot of that personal truth came out in the film and and, and it tends to resonate yeah, pretty widely. Uh, I was just actually talking about it recently. Um, for the first 10 years after it came out, I wasn't really able to separate myself from the experience because um, it was seven months or something like that out of my life mm. doing the uh, audition process, the pre-production, the actual production, and then seeing the film. You know, when I saw the film the first time, it felt like it was five or 10 minutes long to me. I was like, that's such a condensed version of, you know, the last year of my life. That's crazy. And it all fits in that little capsule that is this film, uh, which would be the theatrical release in uh, the 2000 or 2001, whenever it came out. Um, 
but uh, as time has gone on, I'm able to sort of separate myself from it and watch it as a as a, an audience member and enjoy it for the film that it is. And you know, it touches on those amazing universal truths of that period of time in people's lives, and uh, <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty amazingly done. I I mean, I have I could talk about my memories from that uh, all day long, but. Um, in terms of Philip, you know, I, uh, I remember like Philip and Billy Crudup were two like, um, you know, theatrical uh, actors, you know, they'd done a lot of uh, New York theater, which, you know, has a lot of like street cred to it. And um, they were trained, you know, like fucking serious actors, really serious. And I was just some kid from Salt Lake City, Utah, who just like, had this role land in his lap yeah. and uh, they had struggled for years, you know, doing off Broadway and theater work and theater work is pretty brutal. Like, mm. you know, I, I did some theater when I was younger and it's very formative. It's very good training, but it is also pretty brutal. Um, and so they came from this, you know, this uh, tempered background of like the classically trained. And so they would kind of give me shit you know, they were never on set really at the same time, but I remember Philip would be like, who, like, where are you from? Where, where'd you come from? And I'd be like, uh, Salt Lake City. He's like, Salt Lake City. He's like, that's where all the Mormons are from, right? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, okay. And he's like, and you got this part. What's, what else have you been doing? You know, do you do any, any theater? You know, he's kind of like grilling me the first day. And I was like, felt like I was in trouble. I was like, no, I, you know, I did some theater, but you know, this is kind of my first thing. And he's like, <laughs> you're so lucky kid you're so lucky um so he was kind of you know paralleling lester bang's sort of uh tone with william at the time and uh, i remember i think i think we shot all that stuff in san diego uh at the actual record store where cameron met lester um so yeah so I remember meeting Philip and learning that when he was doing all those, that, that scene where he's on the radio show, he had the flu like pretty bad. Like he'd oh, wow. come, yeah, he'd come to work with the flu. So he was basically like catatonic in a chair in between, you know, setups. And then they'd be like, all right, Philip, we're ready for you. And he'd be like, and he'd go in and be Lester and go crazy. And he's, he's talking about Iggy pop and like, crazy high energy and then they'd be like okay cut and he'd basically go vomit and then sit back down in the chair and go catatonic again and so i was like holy cow you know that's a that's a hell of a hell of a day of work um but i you know i remember uh, i've told this story a few times but it, it is the biggest resonance in terms of my time with philip there's a scene where william and lester are uh, in a diner and and Lester's giving William advice and William's taking notes. And uh, we have a lot of interaction where we're looking in each other's eyes. And I remember there had been a light, a large light set outside the window of the diner that was shining into my face. And, um, and I really couldn't look at Philip. Like I, I would look at him and it was so, the brightness was so intense that I just had to close my eyes and look back down. And I felt bad because it was my coverage and I was trying to look at him. I think they had two cameras going at the same time. So they were filming Philip and filming me, um, something like that. But it was really distracting. You know, I wasn't doing a very good job and, uh, and I wasn't saying anything really. I was just trying to keep my eyes open. And John Toll, who is amazing, was telling me that uh, there's this trick where you close your eyes and you look directly at the light with your eyes closed. You let your eyes sort of adjust to that brightness then you look back away from the light and you open your eyes and you're supposed to be able to keep your eyes open. Total fucking bullshit. It's never worked in 22 years of me trying that fucking trick. It has <laughs> never fucking worked. But, but uh, John Toll taught me a lot of other cool stuff that is actually really cool. But um, I remember I was trying that. My eyes were watering and uh, Philip asked me, he's like, hey, you doing all right? You, you kind of can't look at me. You're not looking at me. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm good. I'll, I'll, I'll be better next take, basically that kind of thing. And I kind of thought Philip was mad at me for a minute, but then the next take, I'm like, can't look at him. Can't, my eyes are watering. And Philip's just like, all right. 
I'm done. I'm done doing this. He's like, the kid can't even look at me. He can't see. And uh, he had a kind of confrontation with John Toll, where John Toll was like, hey, you know, I'm lighting the scene. I'm making the scene look good. And, uh, you know, that's kind of that. And Philip was like, I don't give a fuck about your lights. The kid can't act when he's doing this. <laughs> like, this is, this is not what the scene is about. The scene isn't about the fucking kid, you know, being lit. He's like, the kid's got to be able to fucking look at me. And uh, he was also still kind of like in the Lester Bangs headspace. So he was, he was like that. He was very aggressive and very gruff and telling me like, you know, like, do you want the scene to be good, kid? Like, you want it to be good? Well, then you're going to have to be able to fucking look at me. And, um, and then they changed the lights. You know, Cameron was like, okay, everybody, <laughs> chill, chill. We'll change the lights around. And, and you know, John, John was like, oh, I can change the lights. And Philip was like, ah, oh, fucking lights. And I was like, oh. <laughs> So this is fucking intense you know it was the first time i've been around that kind of a thing in a professional yeah. environment and uh phil kind of looked at me after they fixed the lights we did a take it was much much better and philip was like that was much better man much better he's like you see it's it's a good it's a big difference right and i'm like yeah yeah it was a huge difference he's like you know you you gotta you gotta say those things for yourself like uh basically like you're welcome, but also I'm not your babysitter. So learn, learn how to say that shit for yourself. And that was like when that was the first time I realized, Hey, you know, I, I can say that kind of stuff. If it's in a, a reasonable professional uh, way, I can say, Hey, there's something that's throwing me off and I'm not able to do what I am supposed to be doing. So can we, can we make some adjustments? You know, it, it had not even occurred to me before that I was like, oh yeah, it's super bright and I got to be better. I guess I got to make my eyes stay open somehow. But, uh, you know, Philip was like, nah, man, like you, you can ask for some shit, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's such a good story. Thanks for telling me that. appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. better than, Hey, la last year it was all about Jimmy Fallon telling Kate Hudson that he loved her. It was, I don't know, some, some weird <laughs> stuff. So on, he was talking about or something last year on his, uh, on his zoom chats with Kate Hudson. That was quite funny. <laughs> oh my God. That's hilarious. <laughs> oh dear. Anyway, Patrick, thank you so, so much. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, yeah, and, thank you. Yeah, good luck. Good luck with the movie. I, I hope it goes well for you because uh, I really enjoyed it. Me too. Thanks, man. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey You 